Well, good evening, Calvary. It's so good to gather on this day to bear witness once again to this amazing story. And as of tonight, has a horrible ending. But like we will remind ourselves over and over again, has a wonderful ending. There's a place in time in which we get to witness once again the work of Jesus and participate and think about the really hard consequences of our sin, of our burdens, of our shame that was displayed, taken upon himself, at the cross. And tonight, we're going to look at a question Jesus asked. And we've been in a series uh, over and over and seen Jesus ask a lot of people different questions, right? He's asked some crowds some questions. He's asked some friends some questions. He's asked some followers. He's asked some fakes. He's asked some uh, supporters Skeptics, sinners, questions. And tonight, at the very last moment of his life, he asks a very surprising question to his father. Eloi, Eloi, lama shabbatni. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we wouldn't imagine Jesus asking his father such a horrifying question. But as Jesus hangs on the cross, as he lays his life down for his sheep, as he takes on the sin of the world, he takes on the wrath of God. And sometimes it's good for us to think about, to ponder, to witness this wrath. It will lead us in a few short minutes to a deeper appreciation as we taste his body and taste his blood. It's a formative process for us to pause once again on Good Friday and witness and to listen to this question he has for his father. Now we'll pick up the story in Mark 15. Jesus must take on the wrath of God for the past, the present, and the future sins of the world. And in that process, to so take on the wrath of God, he must be forsaken by God, his Father. And we pick up the story in verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabbatni, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this was the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Truly this man. And as we ponder this message and ponder this, this story once again, we, we see that Jesus takes on the full wrath of God and we witness 
First, his agony, the thirst, the loud cries. This man has been hanging on the cross for six hours. His body is worn. He has taken the nails to his hands and his feet. He has been lashed. He has carried the beam to its resting place. And Jesus, we find, as we witness, is in agony because he is a cursed man. He is a man that is stricken for our behalf. Galatians 3 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. Here Jesus in his agony takes on our curse so we don't have to. He takes on our curse that we will never taste. We witness his abandonment. We get it from the, the cloud, the, the, the sun being taken away, the presence of God in a supernatural phenomenon being escorted away from Jesus himself. And this is where we get the famous verse from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Somehow and in some way, Jesus and the Father, Jesus and the Father have to to separate, for God to pull out the full wrath on his son, the full burden of our sins and the sins of the world. And there he is, feeling the removal forsaken so that you and I would never have to be. That the moment of the eternal Trinitarian God, the moment of the great span of time that we can't even imagine, this is the only moment that Jesus and the Father have a space between them so that we would never have a space between him. In this moment, as Jesus is forsaken, and he takes on the full wrath of God, we witness his love. We witness the incredible love of God. That he would, he would take on our sin. He would take on everything we deserve and send his son to death. I can't help but think of the famous verse in John three sixteen: For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whomever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The New Testament writers, as they pick up the story of Jesus going into the, all of the world, want us over and over again to realize that God, God's love is so deep and so powerful and so rich because he took on the wrath of God. It's proven in the sacrifice. It's proven as he bore those sins. Paul in Romans has a famous line. Romans 5, he says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, catch that, not out of happenstance, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showing his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As we witness his love, we can't imagine what it would have felt to be that forsaken and for the cup of wrath to be poured out. We witness the means of reconciliation Romans 5 says this in verse 9, since, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God? For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. 
We witnessed the means of reconciliation, that while we were enemies with God, we were reconciled with him. Not while we were friends, not while we deserved, but while we were enemies. He reconciled. John 3.16 is followed by John 3.17. says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That you and I witness the means of reconciliation as Jesus is forsaken and he takes on the full wrath of God. Oh, what a happy exchange, my friends. Oh, what a happy exchange that the Lord would see kindness in us as we were enemies and at the right time and at the right moment on the right night. He would send his son. So what is our response? What is our response to, we, to this witnessing of the forsaken Jesus? What is our response as we head towards the communion table tonight and once again taste that bread, that juice? What is our response we're either two people in this room tonight. Just as there were two groups in this story. First, we could be the bystander, thirsty for blood, thirsty for a sign, thirsty to make a mockery of this thing, to witness it just for the spectacle, to witness it just for, to see maybe if God would do another sign. Maybe he would call down Elijah, hold off giving him a drink, so that maybe that can happen. They have no clue of actually what the true sign is, is laying there before them with pierced hands and feet. Nailed to the tree. And we could come into the Good Friday once again just for the spectacle of it all. To participate and see maybe if God would show up again when God has shown up at the right time in the right place through his son Jesus Christ. But the bystanders missed it. They were there for the entertainment. Where you can be like the centurion. He was assigned to a job that day. He woke up probably not realizing what he would do. How he would play the part in the crucifying of Christ. He was good at his job, really good at job, probably hundreds of times, maybe even thousands of times, he has put people to death on the crucifying block, the crucifying moment of people being punished for their wrongness, justice being given out, the empire quenching itself on the blood of its enemies. And he's there that day and something's different about this man. Maybe it was the supernatural phenomenon of the day becoming black. Maybe it was the hours upon hours he saw Jesus suffer, unlike anyone else has suffered. Whatever the reason, whatever the reason for him to believe as Jesus took his last breath. As his body gave out. The centurion not taking his eyes away. Confessed truly this man is the Son of God. And you and I, we once again on this night have the chance to be these two people. Being the individual once again to just seek another sign before you believe. 
or finally, finally, finally seeing Jesus hung on the tree, breathing his last, and declaring truly he was the Son of God. And I hope that in our time as we sing, as we pray, that we once again will witness to the world that this is a good Friday. Let us pray. Jesus, you're the crucified king. You're the one who came to redeem, atone by your blood, by your wounds. We are healed. And Lord, may tonight be a night where we once again deepen our commitment, deepen our reality, that we celebrate a wonderful Savior who paid it all, who gave it all on our behalf. And oh Lord, I can't well wait once again for the people of Calvary, for me to taste your body and your blood. And recenter once again, Lord, into the Good Friday story as we bear witness to the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen.